How do you compare in your prayer life to other Americans? I got curious about that, and so I consulted with some Barna research that I found. And so here's some questions for you. How often do you pray? Do you pray every day? 59% of Americans said that they pray every day. To whom do you pray? 90% of Americans say that they pray to God. 50% say that they pray to Jesus Christ. And 23% say that they pray to the Holy Spirit. Do you prefer to pray out loud or do you prefer to pray silently? 82% say that they prefer to pray silently to, them, to God, to themselves. Do you prefer to pray alone or with other people? This is the one that surprised me. 94% said that they preferred to pray alone. Only 2% said that they preferred to pray with other people. Well, what do you pray about the most? I mean, think about that. What do you pray about the most? 62% said that they pray mostly prayers of gratitude and thanksgiving. 61% said that they pray mostly or they pray often about needs that their family or friends have. Only 24% pray for the government. 19% of millennials pray for sleep. <laughs> you can understand that, as busy as they are. If you want to learn about prayer, or if you want to improve your prayer life, the number of books on prayer is overwhelming. Just a few titles. Prayer, The Great Adventure, A Call to Prayer, The Power of Prayer and Fasting. Piercing heaven. So do those titles describe your prayer life? Is prayer an adventure for you? Are you piercing heaven? If you wrote a book, you personally wrote a book based on what your prayer life is like, what would the title be? Would it be How to Pray a Mighty Prayer or something else? Have you ever been discouraged about your prayer life. I think we would do well to just listen to the words of Jesus that he spoke in Matthew 7, verse 7, when he said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Now, according to the grammar of the way it was written, it really would be better to translate it, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on finding, and the door will be open to you. Don't give up on prayer. If you're happy, pray. If you're sad, pray. If you're sick, pray. If you're well, pray. Charles Spurgeon, a minister of many years gone by, said we should pray when we are in a praying mood, for it would be sinful to neglect so fair an opportunity. We should pray when we are not in a praying mood, because it would be dangerous to remain in so unhealthy a condition. I think that the Apostle Paul was in a praying mood when he wrote that second letter to the church in Thessalonica because he included his prayer right in the letter. He, en he encouraged this new church. It was a new church in a city that wasn't very friendly to Christians. I mean, not at all. And he's encouraging them about the Christian faith, and he's also encouraging them with the words that no matter what you're going through right now, I want you to know that Jesus Christ someday is going to make all things right. So this is what he said, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. With this in mind, what I just said, with that in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power... He may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In this prayer, Paul prayed for two things. First, he prayed that our God may count you worthy of your calling. And we covered that last week. And the second thing is that we're going to look at today is that God may bring to fruition 
your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. So what goodness do you desire, to use Paul's terminology here? Now, all Christians say that they are going to follow Jesus, that they are going to take up their cross daily and follow him. So how often, since you decided to follow Jesus, has has God called you or invited you or put a burden on your heart to do some good thing for the kingdom of God, but you did some other thing, some worldly thing, instead of what God had put on your heart to do. Yes, I would like to work in the food pantry. Yes, I would like to help with vacation Bible school. Yes, I would like to teach adults. Yes, I would would like to teach children. Yes, I would like to start a home group. Yes, I would like to do this good thing that the Lord has put on my heart. Yes, I would like to do that. And Lord, I realize that you have gifted me in this area, and it would be something that I could do. It's in my cluster of gifts, and it is a good thing. We we desire good things that we could do for the Lord Jesus Christ. But that would interfere with my bowling night, or that would interfere with my dance lessons, or that would interfere with camping. Well, yeah, I decided to meddle a little bit. Sometimes there's a conflict with what God has called us to do, what God wants us to do, the good, and actually the good things that we decide we want to do. So there's the thing that God calls us to. There are the good things that we think we would like to do. And then there is this other thing that we end up doing. So Paul prays that by God's power, he will bring to fruition our every desire for goodness. Yeah, because we, we desire goodness. I mean, we, we desire other things, too, that aren't a part of God's plan. I mean, they're good things. They're just not a part of God's plan. They're not, they're not evil things. They're not sinful things. They're just other things. The Bible clearly says that God has a plan for us. Not that he is just going to bless whatever we decide to do. Think about this. Surely Paul had a plan for his life. He was a high-ranking leader in Israel. He was a scholar. He had a great resume. He was going places. God had a plan for Paul in his kingdom, and part of that plan was for him to start a church in Thessalonica so that the church in Thessalonica could also be part of God's plan of what he's doing here on this earth. Think about another person. Think about James, the brother of Jesus. Now, James surely had some sort of a plan for his life. I mean, he was the son of Joseph, the carpenter of Nazareth. Maybe maybe he'd learn the trade. Maybe he would would uh, devote full time to that kind of work. Maybe he would get married. Maybe he would settle down. Maybe he would have kids. Maybe eventually grandkids would come along. But his older brother, Jesus, claimed to be God in the flesh. And then he proved it by miracles and by rising from the grave. And he appeared to James That changed everything for James. Now, surely James did not really plan at the beginning to be a church leader. He didn't plan to suffer for what he believed to be martyred as a young man just for telling the truth about Jesus. And yet he had this amazing perspective on life. He wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in James 4.14, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So what does Paul pray here? He prays that God will bring to fruition every desire for goodness, the things that are really good, the things that are eternally good, not that other good, that good that lasts only for this life, that good that's going to end up being burnt up, when this world comes to an end, when 
when your desire for goodness intersects with God's desire for you to do something that is a part of his plan, that's where the real power is. Now, if this pandemic has taught us anything, it has taught us that we don't know what's going to happen six days from now, six weeks from now, six months from now, six years from now. I mean, years ago, I remember growing up, and people used to be talking about something, and they would say that they're going to do this or they're going to do that, and they would, they would say, Lord willing, God willing, I'll, that's what we'll do. This is what we think right now, but we don't really know for sure we'll be able to do this. Now, we have prayed, and we have a plan, but we don't depend on the plan. We depend on God because God is in charge. You know, we think we will do this, Lord willing, because one thing we do know for sure, and that is that we don't know for sure. And then if you're following along in the outline, the other thing that, that Paul prays here is what deeds, he, he, uh, he talks about the deeds that we do. And my question for you is what deeds in your life are prompted by faith? See, that's the second part of this, that there, there are deeds that, that we do that are prompted by faith. Paul prays that these things will be brought to fruition. Fruition. We want to be able to see the fruit of our labor. Sometimes we pray, in fact, that we will be able to see the fruit of our labor. When was the last time you were prompted by faith to do some deed, do something? And, and you weren't even sure it was possible. In fact, it didn't even look like it was possible. But God put it on your heart and you decided, okay, my faith is going to drive me to do this thing even though I don't really think it's possible to do. When we take a risk, when we step out on faith, there's always somebody that's going to try to hold us back. Maybe it's even ourselves. But somebody's going to hold us back. They're going to throw cold water on the thing. They're going to try to talk us down. They're going to criticize the plan. And a lot of times that takes the wind out of our sails. Maybe that's happened to you. Maybe that's happening to you right now. And I imagine there were those who told Paul when he said, I'm going to start a new church in Thessalonica. They said, oh, there's no way you can get one started in Thessalonica. Not Thessalonica. Nobody's going to listen to you in Thessalonica. You can just forget about that, Paul. It shakes our confidence, doesn't it, when somebody says, oh, you can't do that. No matter who you are, no matter how strong a Christian you are, you set out to do some deed that is prompted by faith. And somebody is right there to tell you it won't work. Go ahead and try it anyway. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're going to get criticism. Yes, you're going to get negative emails and texts. You might even get some hate mail. And you say that you're not even going to read that. You, you know who it's coming from, and you know what they're going to say, and you say, I'm not even going to read that email. I'm not even going to read that text. And then you read it, and then you pretty much memorize it, and you say, well, I'm not going to talk about this to anybody. I, I'm not going to mention this. I'm not even going to think about it. And then you end up mentioning it to almost everybody that you talk to. Don't you suppose that is why Paul prayed that it would be by God's power that it would be brought to fruition. It isn't up to us, and not completely, a little bit, but mostly it's up to God. If somebody discourages you, tell, you, tell it to God. It, God gets hate mail all the time. He can handle it. And then the third thing I think we should notice in this passage that helps us as we consider how to live the Christian life is we should get dramatic about this because Paul did. Paul's grammar here is emphatic. Just the word order and the phrasing, it's emphatic. Among other things, he said, so that. Not so what, he said, so that. Whenever we see those words, so that, in Scripture, we know that that is a clause that is intended to draw attention to this is the result, this is the purpose of what, what I've just said, this is the purpose, this is the result of that thing. 
So he's writing in Greek, and that was a dramatic way in Greek of saying, hey, notice, this is my purpose here. This is what I have in mind. And it's, it's not just for the goodness of the thing itself. It's not just that there was this deed and it was a good thing to do. It is so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and in him. So how does that work exactly? How, how does the name of the Lord Jesus Christ get glorified in you? One scholar, William Hendrickson, writes, Paul never lets a day go by without praying for the readers that pious resolutions may become actions and that those actions may be completed. Thus, the name of the Lord Jesus will be glorified. Linsky, another scholar, writes, This is to shine forth in glory so that men may see it. In you does not mean secretly within the recesses of your hearts, for the verb refers to a splendor that is to shine forth so that others may see it. I know people criticize social media, but one thing I really like about social media is that it gives people a chance to highlight some wonderful thing that a family member of theirs or a friend of theirs has done. You know, hey, 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 everybody watch. Look at this. Look at my kid. He almost scored a goal. She almost scored a goal. Look at this. Isn't this amazing? And so the family member, whoever it is, that boy, that girl, that mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, that did something that was really cool, they get a little bit of glory. But you get a little bit of glory, too, because it is your family. It's your kid. It's, it's your mom, your dad, your whoever. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Just think about a time in your life when you were really proud of what some family member of yours did. Just think about how good you felt. I like to imagine Jesus in heaven with the angels talking about, hey, look, this Christian down, this Christian over here, this Christian over there, this church over there, they just got a big victory. And, you know, I just like to imagine that maybe they're, they're high-fiving each other and they're saying, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Look at that. They said they were going to do it and they did it. That's cool. With every win, with every faithfulness, with every overcoming of an obstacle, glory and fame and reputation is brought to the name of Jesus Christ. And that is glory for him. And we, we share in that glory. We are together in this. We are partners in ministry to God be the glory. I was reading about the differences between a microscope and a telescope. You know, they both do the same thing. They both magnify. The difference is that a microscope enlarges, enhances this tiny little thing and makes it look bigger than what it actually is. And a telescope makes something that is big look as big as it really is. You know, we don't serve a small God that needs to be magnified, that needs to, to appear bigger than what he really is. We serve a big God, a powerful God, and we are a telescope to show other people how big God is, how glorious God is, how awesome God is, how wonderful God is, how amazing God is. We are the telescope, and we help people see how big God is. Let's bow for prayer. Lord God, I thank you so much that we get to be a part of this, that we are able to do these things that you call in your word goodness, these deeds that are prompted by faith. And Lord, it's by your power that they happen. You put it on our heart. And we try to do it, and it's by your power that it happens. And Lord, 
Out of all of this, what we seek is just exactly what Paul says here. We seek that your name might be glorified and magnified. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.